This week, we're going to talk about lighting. Uh, and so, uh, that's the next topic is lighting. You can come on up front, that's fine. Uh, lighting, lighting, lighting. So, cameras, cameras don't see as well as you do. <laughs> uh, that's why we have all these lights. Uh, in order to make a, an acceptable video image, you have to have lighting uh, on your subjects in order to create a strong enough video image or electromagnetic signal uh, so that you get a decent picture. Does that make sense? Now, uh, when television really first started, we had analog cameras with uh, very large vacuum tube pickups. Um, and so, in order to create an image at all, you had to have tons and tons and tons of light. And so, and so, TV studios would commonly be equipped with very large Fresnel type lights, like these big red ones, uh, or even larger lights. And so, uh, it would get extraordinarily hot uh, in TV studios. And so that's why, uh, Historically, you know, you needed someone to deal with makeup and powdering your talent because they'd be sitting here sweating, <laughs> just dripping. Does that make sense? Uh, it was very difficult to handle the heat load, uh, and so studios started to be designed in such a way that uh, you had huge uh, ventilation systems that, that would suck the air out, the hot air out. Uh, but it was very, a very difficult thing to have to deal with. Um, but over time, over time, as the cameras improved, you didn't need as much light. And so you were able to start to reduce and start to reduce and start to reduce the amount of light you, uh, that was required uh, to make an image. And then certainly when we converted to digital, when we converted to digital, the light sensitivity of the CCDs went just through the roof. And so the, the nice thing was is that when we were first generation digital doing standard definition digital on a four by three aspect ratio with only 480 lines of resolution, you could actually get away with very low lighting levels and you could create a really good image. Does that make sense? But what has happened since then is that we've gone kind of back uh, in, in some sense because the screens are getting larger, the definition is getting higher, right? So we go into high definition television and the first step into high definition is 720 lines of resolution. Then you go up to 1080 lines of resolution, which is kind of the standard 720 and 1080, that's the standard right now. But are the TVs getting bigger and bigger and bigger? The displays are getting bigger. And so what do you think? Do you need more light? Absolutely, you need more light. Even though the CCDs in the cameras, the imaging devices in the cameras are very, very good, if you're trying to create a really large picture, it's going to take more light. And so what we're starting to see back in the TV studios is that we're starting to go backwards, back into the 60s and 70s with the, with the size and the, the sheer strength of the lighting instruments is going back up again. Uh, and I only see it continuing as we go into uh, 4K, which is 2,160 lines of resolution, and then 8K, which is doubling that. Does that make sense? So, and then, 
of course, LCD panels are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. How many of you have or you have a friend that has one of those ginormous TV screens? I mean, they're just huge, right? And so, Uh, and so, uh, what we're seeing is that you need more light uh, as you go up in definition. So, once you've created a set, once you've created a set, the next thing that you need to do is you have to decide on how you're going to light it. Okay, and there's two primary strategies. There's two primary strategies, each with their own pros and cons. The first strategy that you might follow uh, is called bank lighting. Bank lighting. Bank. Bank lighting is kind of interesting because it exclusively uses uh, floodlights. It exclusively uses floodlights uh, in order to illuminate the set. Uh, and since you're using floodlights, uh, you don't have to spend a whole lot of time uh, tuning these lights. I mean, you have to aim them somewhat, okay, but you don't have to spend a whole lot of time messing around with them. Uh, because they're floodlights, there's just not much you can do. You turn them on and, you know, it's going to light up the whole world. Does that make sense? But a bank, a bank of floodlights, a bank of floodlights is essentially two or more floodlights in a row two or more floodlights in a row. That's what a bank of lights is. Now, I, I suppose for argument's sake, if you had two or more spotlights in a row, yes, that would also be a bank of light. But this particular lighting strategy, we're dealing with floodlights. Okay, So it uses floodlights, floodlights. Since you're using floodlights, you don't have to use that many lights, okay? You don't have to use that many lights, and so you're really starting to get uh, some efficiencies happening here, okay? So you don't have to use all that many lighting instruments. So do you think this is going to be fairly simple and quick? Do you think it's fairly simple and quick? And the answer is, well, yeah, because you're just not dealing with that much stuff, okay? So this type of lighting is, is fast, it's simple, okay. So uh, you know these are some advan. Th th these that's those are two real strong advantages, especially when you're just talking about speed, okay. Speed, time is money, right? Especially when you're paying some guy like me two hundred dollars an hour to do your lights, right? All right. So if we take an overhead view of this, this thing that we designed, if you take an overhead view, it kind of looks something like this, although I'm sure that angle's not quite as steep. But you have your two chairs there. You have your two chairs there. And if you were going to bank light this, essentially you're just going to line up a row of lights right across the front. Right across the front. So you would wind up with probably a bank of around four lights right across the front, all right, providing forward illumination. That is the most important, okay? Before you do anything else, you have to have forward illumination because the cameras are going to be back here, right, looking at your set, so you have to provide forward illumination. And so with four maybe even three uh, floodlights, I could probably do this pretty quick. All right, boom. Four lights, no tuning, just turn them on. But uh, slight problem shows up. It depends on what kind of light bulb you have in your floodlight. Okay, as to how you're going to approach this. So here at Eastern, we have these fluorescent soft boxes. Fluorescent soft boxes. These are floodlights, but they're fluorescent soft boxes. 
And fluorescent lights, you know, hey, they don't use much electricity. That's a bonus. That's a bonus. And they don't really get all that hot. So that's another bonus. Okay. But do you think um, fluorescent lights are very strong? Are they very, do, are they powerful? And the answer is no. They don't have a very strong throw. Okay, so their throw is only like maybe 10 to 12 feet. All right, so if you were going to try to light this up with your forward lighting, you would have to have those lights down off the grid on extension poles. Do you see how these are down off the grid on extension poles? You'd have to have them down and you'd have to have them within 10, I wouldn't go much beyond 10 feet, quite honestly. All right, 10 feet off the nose of the talent. Does that make sense? 10 feet's not very far. All right, 10 feet's not very far. So are those lights gonna be like right in their face? Yeah, and so it really creates a very tight situation, which I don't like, <laughs> because if you need to move anything around the studio, you're gonna be doing what? Are you going to be banging into these things, right, if you're trying to move a flat or if you're trying to move a ladder or something like that? And the other thing is, is that your camera shots all have to shoot underneath of these things. Does that make sense? So you have to have a very tight control on the height of your cameras. But, but, fluorescent lighting, uh, fluorescent lighting is a very soft, uh, pleasing type of light. It's not harsh. It's not intense. Uh, and so uh, your talent is going to look actually really pretty good underneath of a very soft type of lighting. Does that make sense? It's very easy on the eyes. Uh, so let's say you have talent that's uh, getting a little bit long in the tooth and the wrinkles are showing up and that kind of stuff. Uh, super, super soft lighting is going to ease that off. The shadows, uh, you'll have some shadows, but the shadows will not have very sharp edges. Uh, any shadows that you do have will be very, very soft edged. So fluorescent lights have, have um, you know, they, they, they have some benefits, but be aware that you're going to have to get them down and you're going to have to get them close. All right. Another option would be to go ahead and use halogen soft boxes. Halogen soft boxes. And if you look in the back there, you see the ones that are uh, made by the Ari, com the company called Ari, uh, Soft 2000s. Those are halogen soft boxes. Those are halogen soft boxes. Do you think those uh, are probably a bit more intense? Yes, halogen light, halogen light tends to be intense, and it tends to throw really well, okay? But the bulbs get extraordinarily hot, okay? Extraordinarily hot. So anytime you're dealing with a lighting instrument that has a halogen bulb in it, you have to wear gloves, you have to be super careful, you can't t ever touch the bulb, even when it's cold, with your bare fingers because the oil on your fingers gets on the glass, the glass heats up, the oil starts to bubble, kablang, no good. Does that make sense? All right, so you may be saying, well, what about LEDs? And the answer is, well, LEDs is, are kinda nice because they're right in the middle, all right? LEDs don't use much juice, but believe it or not, LEDs do get hot, all right? Not as hot as a halogen, but they do get hot. Um, so LED floodlights in a softbox type of a configuration would really be ideal. Uh, but the conversion to LED has been a bit slow, a bit slow. It's happening in the consumer world a lot faster than it is in the professional world. Uh, and so LED lighting instruments, they're, they're out there, but they're still pretty expensive. Question. Yeah, and lots of little itty bitty. Yeah, if you see lots of itty bitty individual lamps, it's LED. Oh, like a bunch of fluorescent lamps. 
Some cars are now coming with LED uh, lights on them, some, some cars. Uh, so anyhow, your first object is to provide this forward piece of illumination. Your next object is to provide a bank of light, and this is the second most important. Once you've got the front dealt with, your second object here is you're going to have to provide backlighting. You're going to have to provide backlighting. Why do we have to illuminate the back of the subject? Why do we have to throw some light on the back of the subject? So it would look like this. If I draw it over here, the bank does not have to be quite as big. You might be able to get away with just two. All right. But why do you have to light them up off the back? Why do you have to give them backlight? Yeah. Well, yeah, it creates depth. It does do that. What? It separates them from the background. Bingo, bingo. That is it. Double gold star right there. It separates them from the background. If you don't provide backlighting on your subject, what happens is, even with a, 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 a blue psych or something like that, or God forbid you have a black psych, what will happen without backlighting is they're going to be sucked in. It looks like they're being sucked into the outer space or something, okay? Uh, because remember that the cameras can't see as well as you do. You might look at it and go, oh, well, I can see the psych, and I can see that, you know, but looking through the camera, it's going to look like they're being sort of sucked into the background, and you don't want that. So you always have to provide this rear illumination. Now, believe it or not, I could stop right there. With bank lighting, remember, fast, simple, I could stop right there. Boom, I'm done. Do my TV show. Six lights. No tuning, right? Just kind of aim it at about a 45 degree angle and you are done. Does that make sense? So I could complete this all by myself less than an hour. I could have this completely lit up and it would be fine uh, for the show. Now, would it be very interesting light? Really try to think about it. Would it be sort of humdrum? Would it, be, would it have any dramatic effect? Or would it be just sort of light? <laughs> it won't really draw your attention that it's interesting. Yeah, it won't draw your attention. It won't have any intensity. It won't have any dramatic effect, but listen, if you're doing a, a morning show, right, uh, like The View or whatever, where they're just all sitting around talking, <laughs> do you need intense light, or should it just look like, hey, it's the daytime, good morning, we're talking about whatever, you know, so it's like Kathy Lee and Hoder or whoever that person is, and they just sit around chatting, right? So, you know, you don't need to go overboard with that type of a TV show, but you're not going to have any dramatic effect. The other thing is this, and this is more important, do you have individual control over each chair? Do you have individual control? So, for example, let's say this person comes in wearing dark clothing and this person comes in wearing lighter clothing. This person's going to be reflecting light. This person's going to be absorbing light. Well, can I do anything about it with bank lighting? No, because what I'd want to do is probably kick this person up a little bit and probably kick this person down a little bit, right? But can I do that with bank lighting? No, you don't have individual control. Bummer. That is probably the biggest bummer is, and I'm going to make an unhappy face, control. I don't have control over it. It's fast. 
It's quick, it's easy, it's fast, new and improved, but no control. And if you happen to be a control freak, like someone like me, probably not the best idea, right? But you can, uh, if you've got a little bit more time, you can add two side banks to this. You could add two side banks. If you have a little bit more time, you could go ahead and add, it, add some side banks in here. They're not really necessary, uh, but let me try to explain what you've just done. If you do your forward, your back, and then you go ahead and do your sides, have you created an area of action? And the answer is absolutely. You've just essentially created one entire circle as an area of action because no matter where you are in that circle, no matter where you are in that circle, will you be illuminated? No matter what direction you look, will you be illuminated? No matter where the cameras are or where the talent is, guess what? You've got video and you've got a pretty good picture. Does that make sense? So if your talent, if your talent has to move around, if your talent has to move around, if they have to have the ability to move, let's say you're doing some type of uh, dramatic production or you're doing a, I don't know, it could even be a sitcom or something like uh, Seinfeld. You know, if they need to move around, like the hallway outside of Jerry Seinfeld's apartment, if they need to be able to move, okay, and be illuminated, this is going to work pretty well. Do you follow me on that? But do you have individual control? No. All right. But uh, it's one strategy that tends to work pretty decent. Um, I will tell you this. If you ever have to light up a studio audience, all right, have you ever been watching a show that has a studio audience and occasionally they light up the audience and people in the audience are either a part of the show or they're getting interviewed or something like that. Uh, well, how would you approach lighting an audience? Banks, banks, big giant banks of light, just in rows. Uh, one time I did a, 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 a debate, a political debate, and they, they were going to do the town hall kind of a thing where people in the audience could come to a microphone and ask questions. Does that make sense? And so the people had to be lit up and people couldn't be tripping on themselves and whatnot. And so what I did with that was I just ginormous banks of light, like eight lights in a row, just and then 12, maybe 14 feet forward from that, another whole row and just lit them all up. Does that make sense? Now you may be saying to yourself, well, if you're doing, if you have to light up a really large area, why don't you just use the regular house lights? So let's look up in the ceiling and you see the house lights. Those are just standard industrial fluorescent lights. Why can't you just use regular fluorescent lights? Like when you walk into the gymnasium, there's lights. You walk into the Betty Tipton room, right? There's lights. Why can't we just use those lights? Why is that not ideal? Yeah. Well, it'll probably be even enough, but it has to do with color. Does anybody know what's going on with the color? All right. Well, it's not, it's not, we'll, we'll get to that. You're close though. You're very close to the money. Um, television lights are full spectrum lights. Television lights, including the fluorescent lights, are full spectrum lights. What does that mean to you? Full spectrum. Full spectrum lights. If you put the light through a prism, what's going to come out on the other side? A perfect rainbow. A perfect rainbow. In other words, the light contains all the colors. Does that make sense? So a television light is full spectrum. 
full spectrum. And in fact, that's what makes these fluorescent lights kind of special. These are full spectrum fluorescents. Normal fluorescent lights and normal light bulbs that you buy at Home Depot, okay, are they full spectrum? Not all of them, no. So, can anybody tell me what kind of light or what color, what color is coming off of those industrial fluorescent lights up there in the ceiling? Or if you walk down the hallway, what color is falling on you? It's not yellow, actually. It looks yellow, though. What? It's not off-white. It's a color. If you actually held a prism right here, you'd get one color coming out the other side. Anybody? Blue. It's blue. Good guess. It's blue. It's blue. And so, is that good for creating a video image? Nope. It's not. All right. So, anyhow. Uh, all right, so enough of that. So bank lighting is quick, it's dirty, it's fast, but you lose control. You lose control, so it's no good. It's, it's really uh, no good, uh, especially if you really want your lighting to really look as good as it possibly could be. But just realize that if, you're try if you don't have a lot of time, this will work. If you don't have a lot of time, this will work. Or if your talent's going to be moving around, this will work. All right. So the next strategy that I want to talk about today comes to us from the world of photography. So for those of you that have ever taken a photography class, this will probably sound a little bit familiar. How many of you have heard of three-point lighting? Three-point lighting, and a bunch of hands go up, yeah. Three-point lighting, three-point lighting uh, is essentially what we call the photographic lighting principle. Well-timed, ding, the photographic lighting principle. It uses three lights for each primary target. Three lights for each primary target. And that's a key idea there, primary target. Primary target, three lights. So, three lights for each primary target. Those lights have names. They're called the key light the fill light, and the backlight. The key light, the fill light, and the backlight. The key light, the fill light, and the backlight. Okay. The key light, uh, oh, by the way, three-point lighting uh, tends to use spotlights. Three-point lighting tends to use spotlights. Focusing spotlights, focusing spotlights like the Fresnel. Uh, pretty much exclusively, although depending on the lighting designer you're working with, the fill light may or may not be a spotlight, all right? But the key light is definitely going to be a spotlight. It'll probably be a 1,000 watt Fresnel. A 1,000 watt Fresnel, all right? The fill light, the fill light can also be a 1,000 watt Fresnel, but sometimes your lighting designers are going to want some type of floodlight in that position. All right, it might be a soft box of some kind, or it might be what we call a broad, which is a very small type of soft box that has a halogen light bulb in it. But sometimes you will the request will be for some type of a floodlight. Uh, I'd rather just use a, a defocused Fresnel myself, but that's me. 
And the backlight is going to be a Fresnel, but this is absolutely super important to think about. Uh, the backlight needs to be smaller. The backlight needs to be smaller. So uh, if we're using 1,000 watt Fresnels for the key and the fill, it just needs to be less than 1,000, okay? Now here at Eastern, uh, our smaller ones are 650s. You might have 500s. Uh, that's pretty common. Uh, ours just happen to be 650s. So this will be a 650 watt Fresnel. Okay. So three lights on each primary target. Well, Dr. Utterback, what the heck is a primary target? A primary target is where you have talent. A primary target is where you have talent addressing the audience, talking to the camera, okay, or talking to each other, delivering lines if it's a dramatic production. But that's what a primary target is. So how many primary targets do I have? I have two, but let's think about a typical newscast. How many primary targets do you have at the desk? There's four. There's four. Even though nine times out of ten when you look at the desk there's only two people there, there's actually four primary targets because occasionally they are joined by the sports anchor or the meteorologist or both right? So you, I've got four primary targets at a news desk and then do I have a primary target in front of my uh, chroma key wall? Yeah. So how many primary targets do I have? Five. And how many lights? Each? Yeah, we're up to 15 lights. Whoa. 15 lights? Is this going to take me some time? Even if I'm only charging my low rate at 150 an hour, this is going to take some time. This is going to cost you some money, right? So three-point lighting, bummer, it's kind of slow. <laughs> it's slow. It's going to take time. It's not quick and dirty. Every single light has to be located, hung, aimed, and tuned. It has to be tuned. Floodlights are not tunable. Spotlights are. I have to hang it, I have to locate it, hang it, aim it, tune it. I mean, this is going to take real time. And I'm just up to 15 lights. Yeah. What's involved in tuning it? I'll show you. That's Wednesday's lecture. <laughs> All right, I'll do a demo. I'll actually climb up there and do some of this stuff. You'll be like, oh, Dr. Utterback, don't fall. Um, all right, it's slow, it's slow. But, real quick, do I have individual control over this person and individual control over this person? Yeah. Absolutely, so the big double star check mark circle underline is that I have tons of control. I have control. What if I have someone that's a little shorter or someone that's a little taller? Can I adjust the lights just for them? Absolutely, I can. This person's wearing dark clothing. This person's wearing lighter clothing. Can I make some adjustments? Kick this person up, kick this person down, make it nice and even. Somebody said even earlier. Yeah. Is it worth it? Absolutely. The other thing about three-point lighting is that since you're using spotlights and typically you're going to have halogen bulbs, is this lighting a bit more dramatic? Is the character of the light more dramatic? Is it going to be a bit more intense? And the answer is yeah. It looks better. It looks better. It's, it's got some real intensity to it. Uh, the shadow lines are going to be sharp. The shadow lines are going to be sharp. So it's kind, of, it's kind of a nicer light to work with 
And spotlights, do they throw pretty far? Oh yeah, they'll throw a very good distance. So can you leave them up in the grid? <laughs> the answer is yes. So remember that a spotlight generates a light that's parallel, very close together, intense. And floodlights, it's more like this. It's kind of not parallel, so if that's the light, it's not parallel, it's not very close together, and it's all scattered out, I guess is a way to think about it. But let's go back to primary positions just for a second. Let's think about some TV shows that you might be familiar with. Uh, let's think about the TV show Jeopardy. Jeopardy. How many uh, primary positions do we have in Jeopardy? Well, we've got one, two, three positions for the players, right? And then we've got who? Well, Alex Trebek, right? Do you think he's got fabulous lighting? Of course. Uh, and then that's probably pretty much it. Now, is, are there any secondary lighting areas, though? Give me an example. What are the secondary lighting areas? Stuff that just needs to be lit up so that we can see it. Okay, yeah, the, the clues, the clues. What happens at the end of the show? Does Trebek walk around on the stage with the winner? Typically, they walk downstage a little bit, right? Does that area, but, but do they talk to the audience? They talk to each other. Do they really talk to the audience, though? No, but they're chatting with each other. So is that a secondary area that needs to be illuminated? All right, so what am I going to do with the clue screen? I'm going to probably use bank lighting. What am I going to use with the front of the stage? Some bank lighting. But then I've got my three, my uh, four primary areas. What am I going to do with that? Three point. Does that make sense? How many of you guys remember the TV show Seinfeld? You ever see that show? Maybe in reruns? Maybe some of you saw it live. I don't know. Um, think about Jerry Seinfeld's apartment. Where are the primary positions in that apartment? Okay, well, think, let's think about the living room. The couch in the living room has how many primary positions? Two or three? I think it's only two. I think it's only two. I could be misremembering that, but I think there's only two. Then the kitchen had three primary positions, one right next to the refrigerator, two at the little counter. And then who remembers Kramer? You remember Kramer, the really super tall guy, right? The neighbor, right? That actor is huge, I mean super tall. So the lighting had to be customized for him, right? Think of George Costanza standing next to Kramer, right? But think about it, the front door, right? How many of his lines were given right there? Like 80%, he'd open the door, Jerry! And he'd never move. You ever? Newman, too, who was much shorter. Yeah, New <laughs> Newman, Newman, Newman. Um, but that's an example of another primary area. But occasionally they would do shoots in that diner and occasionally they would do shoots in the hallway, like between Jerry's apartment and Kramer's apartment, right? Well, areas where they're just kind of moving through, they might give a line or two, but would those be secondary areas that you could probably get away with bank lighting? Yes. Is this starting to make sense? If you watch your favorite TV shows and really watch, you'll start to see the primary positions. The actors and the actresses are always delivering their lines from the same exact spot. Because they're walking right to their, what? They're walking to their mark where the lights are. Do you, does that make sense? So that can make it easy, like the same way that the lighting would be easy to have the door drop by just like that. Or they could have made it anywhere. They could have done it anywhere, but that's exactly where they chose to do it. And so that's one of those primary areas. But if you watch TV, you'll start to see it. 
you, you'll be like, oh, that's a primary spot, that's a primary spot, that's secondary, that's primary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Now, occasionally, if they're, you're dealing with a sound stage, they just light up the whole planet. They just put ginormous Fresnels up and they just light the whole thing up. And that's the same effect as what? Bank lighting. It's the same exact effect. No matter where you are, you're going to be illuminated in the same way. Yeah? Is it, is this type of lighting using like, you know, like reality type shows as well? Well, reality shows that are on location, reality shows that are shot in the field. You're, do, you're dealing, what, what's your primary lighting source? Sun. The sun. The sun is your primary lighting source. And so, no, it's a really good question. The sun becomes your key light. The sun becomes your key light. And so you have to be aware of where the sun is when you're shooting. Does that make sense? So I would not want to shoot, like if the sun's right there, and there's a 2K that's like blinding me right now. If that's the sun, would I want to shoot toward the light or would I want to shoot away from it? Away from it, right? I always want my back towards the primary light source. And so field shoots, uh, whether you're doing something like a reality show uh, or whether you're just doing... Um, uh, ENG, electronic news gathering, you're just out, sh uh, you know, shooting news. Yeah, the f one of the first things you do, you go, okay, where's the sun? Where's it at? And then you make adjustments for it. Now, a lot of cameras, field cameras, also have uh, onboard lighting. It's called a sun gun. Uh, that's an old term, but uh, probably trademark. Uh, but a sun gun is just a little onboard light. And so let's say I was going to interview you out on the street. I could kick that little sun gun on, and it would give just enough punch to, to sort of be a key light for you. Does that make sense? So how many of you have seen that? Re report, or not reporters, but field shooters out running around with a field camera, and it's got a little itty-bitty light on it. Uh, those are, that's where we're seeing a lot of LEDs because they don't use much electricity, and so, is your unit battery powered? Yes. Absolutely, you know. And so, anything that uses a lot less electricity, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. All right. Any questions about three point at this stage? Do you have to like worry about overlap, like in terms of how light it is and stuff like that? Well, let's let's go on to the next step: locating these things. So you ready for the participation part of today? Yes. All of you, yeah, I'm going to have to make you do something. All right, so where do you put these things? You've decided you're going to do three-point lighting. Well, what you do is you actually sit in your talent position or stand in your talent position, and the first thing you do is you make a 45-degree angle with your arms. Go ahead. Do it. I dare you. Go ahead, just like this. Not like this, not like that. 45 degrees, 45s. All right, now, take your left hand up to the grid and kind of make a circle. Anywhere in there, that's the location for your key light. So, left hand key light. Go ahead, write that down. Left hand key light. 45 degrees up and out. Anywhere in there, you don't have to get out a laser, okay? Just anywhere in there, it's close. All right, so now go back up again, but this time with your right hand, and right about in there, that's where your fill light's gonna be. That's where your fill light's gonna be. Your fill light. So key light, fill light. All right. Is everybody and in fact, how many of you can actually see my key and my fill? That's the key. That's the fill right there. Do you see them? I can. Man, they're like right in my face. The backlight, 45 degrees up and out. Ha! It's not on. It's the one that's plugged into circuit 43. 
right next to this uh, psych light here. Yeah, that little blue 650, that's the backlight for this position right here. And this, yeah, that one's the backlight for this position right here. So f that's another reason why you have to have your set pushed forward a bit is so that you can get that 45 degree kick. Remember, is backlighting important? Yes, because it's going to push the subjects off the background. Yes, no blank? Now that I'm completely blind. Is this making sense? All right, now, at some point in the 80s, early 90s, lighting directors started to fool around with the key light. They started to fool around with the key light. So some lighting directors wanted that key light not at 45. Some lighting directors, instead of putting it over there, they said, I prefer my key light at 90. All right, so you would have a 90 degree key light straight off the nose, Pew! deer in headlights. And so it would be anywhere in there and your fill light would stay over here on the 45. Does that make sense? And then some lighting directors were like, oh, I'll put it over there. Put it over here, put it over there, put it over here, put it over there, put it over here, put it over there. No, split the middle. <clears throat> so depending on who you were working for, started to drive guys like me nuts. And so you know what we started doing? What do you think we started doing? just to save time and stress. Nope. What would you do? What would you do? I'd just go ahead and hang one there, hang one there, and hang one there, right? While you're at it, that way the LD walks in, you go, huh, you choose. So, a variation on this, a variation on this is called triple key. A variation on this is called triple key. Do you understand where it came from though? All right. Triple key simply adds, if I draw it, you know, if this is your target, you've got your backlight coming in like this and triple key is essentially doing this. Does that make sense? So if this is the primary position I've got bang, bang, bang. Make sense? And in fact when you fire all three of them up it actually looks really good. So why not? And so triple key, triple key, uh, this, this idea here, triple key, this is very, very common, very common. And my understanding is, is that this is the preferred lighting strategy at ESPN, is triple key. But again, these are for primary positions. Typically, your talent's not going to be moving around, right? They're going to be seated. They're going to be talking to the audience, or they're seated talking to each other or what have you. This is not really for moving around because if they move, if they move even just that much, are they going to move out of their light? Yeah, because it's super focused, super focused. But mathematicians, if you've got five primary positions, you're now up to what? 20 lights. 20 lights. Is this going to take time? Am I going to get to buy a new Porsche? Yes. Right? Okay, so uh, one last variation. One last variation adds yet another light. Uh, one variation on this adds yet another light. The backlight, the backlight is aimed quite literally at the back. Okay? So if I was aiming a backlight for this particular position here, 
I'm not aiming at the person's head. The, the head is right about there. I'm aiming this thing at their back, usually the lower back, because I'm trying to create sort of a light punch that's going to separate them off the back. Does that make sense? Now, I can add one more backlight. I can add one more backlight, and it doesn't really matter which side you put it on. It doesn't really matter if you put it here or if you put it there, but you could add one more backlight. All right, but this one is not a backlight. What it is is a hair light. It's a hair light. A hair light just for hair. Okay, but as you might imagine, this is reserved for talent that actually has hair. Okay, would you want to use a hair light on me? No, what would happen? It would just bounce right off the top of my head, right? So a hair light is aimed at the head. It's aimed at the head. And so if you're hitting my head with a bunch of light, what's going to happen? It's just going to like, you're going to get this weird hot spot thing on my, so it's not going to work. But many talent, uh, some guys, although not that many guys that I can think of right off the bat, but a lot of women have super fabulous and they spend tons of cash on their hair, right? Can everybody picture uh, a woman on TV right now that has super fabulous hair, Kathy Lee, right? Well... If you hit it with its very own light, what do you think it looks like? What? It looks good, but what does it simulate? What does it simulate? It looks like what? It glows. Yes. But what's it simulate? What's it look like in real life? sunshine. Looks like sunshine. All right. Honestly, it looks like sunshine. And sometimes we even put in a little bit of uh, yellow gel material in a hair light just to give it that little yellow, just a little, not much, just sort of a straw yellow. And you just, just punch it up just a little bit. So the next time you're watching MSNBC, CNN, or whatever it is that you watch, if you see someone with a big fabulous do, really look, and I bet you'll go, ah, oh, yeah, there's a hair light. There's a hair light. It's not that intense. It's, it's not very intense. It doesn't have to be. But it's just enough to sort of give it that shine, right? Makes sense. But how many lights are we up to? Is this going to take time? Is this going to cost the station some money? Right. Especially if it's all customized. Question? Just uh, wondering how far away it goes. How far away? Uh, you know, the, you're using a halogen light, so the throw is what? Is it good? Yeah. yeah, the throw is far with a halogen, so it could be easily 20 feet away. Easily. Uh, it's probably not going to wind up being quite that far. Uh, in our example here, these lights are probably, what, 12, maybe a bit further, probably about 15. Making sense? So, once you've built your set, you have to decide how you're going to light it. Once you've built your set, you have to decide how you're going to light it. Each strategy has its own pros and cons, all right? Now, let's talk about why, another reason why it's such a pain in the butt. When you're doing three-point, triple key, or God forbid, triple key with a hair light, when you're doing that, you have to tune 
each light. You have to tune each light. With flood lighting, you don't have to tune it. You can't tune it, all right? They, you can't adjust the strength of the light. Who knows what this thing is? Does anybody know what this is? What is this? Anyone? Yes. Yeah, you. it gives you numbers. It's a light meter. It's a light meter. It's a light meter. It measures the amount of light reflecting off of a subject. It can also measure the amount of light coming in on that subject. So not only will it measure reflective light, 112 foot candles. It'll also measure incoming light, 527 foot candles. All right. But this part here is the sensor, this little white half circle thingamabob. So that's the sensor. To activate it, you just simply press this button right here. Press the button, let go, and then you look at your screen and it tells you how many foot candles you've got. All right. A foot candle is one way to measure light. There's other ways to do it. You can measure light in lux, L-U-X. But I like foot candles. It's real basic. It's easy to remember. A foot candle is the amount of light given off by a candle one foot away. A foot candle is the amount of light given off by a single candle 12 inches away. Make sense? Super basic, very easy to remember. Now, each light in a three-point setup or a triple key setup, each light has to be tuned to the same number of foot candles. All right, that's why these lights, these lights focus and defocus. When you focus them, it's going to increase. When you defocus them, it's going to decrease. But the amount of foot candles that you want the amount of foot candles that you want entirely depends on what? What do you think it depends on? Whether I want 500 foot candles or 120 foot candles or 90 foot candles. What does it depend on? The amount of light that I want. Is it a camera duration, the lenses duration? It's not the lenses, but it's the cameras. Right? Remember at the very beginning of today's lecture, I was talking about how we need more light for high definition, less light for standard definition. Remember I was talking about member membering? Or was that, that's almost an hour ago. I've forgotten all of that. So it's going to depend on the cameras. It's going to depend on the cameras as to how many foot candles on average you're going to need off of each lighting instrument. And so the only way to know this is to really consult with your broadcast engineer, consult with people who have been working at the facility for a while, and they'll tell you, hey, these cameras really dial in at 200, these cameras dial in at 120, what have you. Our cameras, our cameras, 120 foot candles each lighting instrument all right 120 that's what I'm aiming for but it doesn't have to be exactly 120 you'll spend all day tweaking it to get a exactly 120 you know it's sort of like positioning a key light anywhere over in there is good all right you don't have to get out a laser same thing with this but how much light do you think we have going right now, just in the studio? I mean, we've got some lights on because we're f videotaping the class, but how much light do you think's on you? What's coming in? Well, let's take a wild guess here. How much is reflecting off your face? Mm -hmm. How many foot candles? Yeah. Are you, is he highly reflective? You got a hundred or you got a hundred foot candles reflecting. 
how much you got actually coming in? 300. So he is absorbing what? 200 foot candles. Isn't that amazing? So you, you are highly absorbent, <laughs> right? But imagine if he's wearing darker clothing. Would it be, you know, the difference would be even more. How much is bouncing off the floor? 57. 250. Interesting, isn't it? See what's happening over here with you guys. 400 coming in. 141 coming back. Does that make sense? So the 120 that I'm talking about, and I'll show you this on Wednesday when we start doing this, tuning the lights when I do the demo, uh, that's the amount coming in. So I'm going to want the key light coming in at 120. I'm going to want the fill light coming in at 120. I'm going to want the backlight coming in at 120. Does that make sense? Yes, Dr. Utterback. Okay. Question? Question. Absolutely. Darker skin tones are going to do what? Absorb light. Skin tones like me? Am I a high re I am a highly reflective surface, unfortunately. You know, that's why I spent my life in a control room and not in the chair. Right? I I have a face that's not made for I have a face for radio. I guess. Does that make sense? Utterback was hiding in the control room. I might but if you were gonna put me up here, what would you have to do? To reduce my reflectivity. You'd have to do what? Makeup. How much makeup? A lot of matte foundation. A lot of foundation, right? In fact, sometimes they, uh, nowadays they use liquid makeup and little miniature, uh, like, spray paint. You know what I'm talking about? So you literally just close your eyes and they, they spray paint you. Isn't that? I met Dan Rather once. Dan Rather's about that tall. It was really funny. I got it. I was in an elevator. CBS. Elevator door opens, and there's Dan Rather. I'm like, hi. My mom really likes you um, or enjoys watching your show. But what I was struck by was just how much makeup he was wearing. I mean, it just was like really a lot. And I was like, wow, because on TV it doesn't look that way, right? Because the light is, you know, his face is absorbing the light uh, on the video image. But in real life, with normal lighting, right, it, it looked like, whoa, like you had just run into a, a, cir a circus clown in, in some ways. Question. Is there a certain amount of light that's just going to reflect off of, or I'm not sure how many is going to be like? Well, you hope, you hope that your reflected light is going to be even. All right. So remember how I said if you have someone wearing darker clothing and someone wearing lighter clothing, right? If I'm hitting them both with 120 on average, am I going to get the same reflected? No. So what am I going to have to do to get the same reflected light? The person that's wearing the darker clothing, I'm going to need to do what? Kick it up a little bit. The lighter clothing, kick it down a little bit in the hopes that I will get somewhat of an average reflected light. So yeah, the ideal, the absolute ideal is to get even, even lighting. And in fact, that's the biggest challenge with chroma key walls. If you want the chroma key effect, 
to work really well, the lighting on the screen has to be as even, not the lighting in front, not, not this lighting needs to be pretty good, but the lighting on the screen itself, where the video switcher is actually creating the effect, it, the, the more even it is, the better the chroma key effect will actually be produced. All right. Now, on Wednesday, what we're going to do is a lighting demo. Uh, we'll actually pick one of these uh, or pick somewhere out here and we'll do three-point lighting and I'll show you what it looks like. Enjoy the weather while you can. I hear it's going to start raining.